Hi, my name is Carol Fitzpatrick. My maiden name is McGinnis. My family homesteaded in the Berryessa Valley. Uh, and uh, we're here to uh, show you some of the displays before it's taken down here at the Winters Museum. So this first map here is of uh, the early settlers of the Berryessa Valley. It's uh, it's the valley, it's cut out here and it shows it and it used to be Rancho Las Putas which was um, when the Berryesses lived there, that's what, it would, that's what their land grant was called. And of course the Native Americans lived there prior to, to them. So this shows like the early settlements of who owned the land uh, sectioned off before the lake. And it shows like where the Puta Creek went through all the different sections and ranches. And then the second map here is that the government put together and it shows where the take line is. Like, so, so this is the take line of where they knew the lake was going to come up. This was all like created before, before they filled it. So they knew whose land that they needed to take. <laughs> and uh, so it shows like who lived where, uh, along the take line and who got to keep their property. And then there's like a little table of contents key here that shows the names. This here is the bell. Um, my friend Wesley's uh, grandmother went down in the valley when they were selling stuff off uh, to get rid of it, you know, that they were, they were taking everything down, the schools, the community hall, everything, and she purchased this and put it in storage. And then years later, when we decided that we wanted to do this exhibit, uh, it kind of like came out of the woodwork, and, and uh, this used to be in the school, but we believe it to have been in the church prior to that, and the church had burned down in the early years, and then they used it for the school. It, it's a pretty cool bell. <laughs> We're pretty proud of it. So over here we have these books, and they're all about uh, the prominent families that were in the valley, and it, and it shows uh, their genealogy of way back. Uh, and it goes all the way from the Adams to the the Downings and down to the Washabas. So it's it's all the family. So the people that family lived in the valley, they can come in and open it up and read about their family, see pictures. Uh, this is a current uh, photo of Lake Berryessa as it is now. And uh, George Gamble and, and Buddy Gardner uh, got together and drew in, to their knowledge, because they were uh, Monticello boys, of where the main roads were, the main ranches, where the creek went through, where town is, where the, the big rock bridge is here. So they, it kind of gives a visual for um, people that don't, you know, like where was Monticello? Well, well, Monticello is right here at the bottom of Lake Berryessa, so it's a really neat display. Here is uh, Sharon Getz here in this picture. She went to school here in Winters. The, uh, all the people that were in high school used to ride the bus all the way down the windy road, past where the dam is, coming through Devil's, Devil's Gap there, Devil's Gate, um, and would come to high school here. And she ended up being uh, one of the Youth Day Parade girls. And this is the dress she wore. And this is her here in the dress. This is her graduation dress that she she uh, graduated from the eighth grade here, and this is her wearing it. And down here is a, a Purple Jones photo, Aunt Letha with uh, I can't remember who the baby is, but um, this was one of the pictures that Purple Jones took when um, he came into the valley. To, for the last year. This is a display of artifacts that were from the McKenzie store. The McKenzie store was like the largest uh, general store in the area. 
This is a picture of them tearing it down in 1956, and there's three men looking over at it as as it's starting to come down. It, right here is a picture of uh, inside the store, and it shows all the all their wares and somebody's drinking a some soda there. Uh, so these are like artifacts that, that came out of the area. Uh, some, here's some cookie cutters and an iron and a sifter, some medicine bottles. Kind of shows, shows kind of the stuff that they used to have back then in the day. This is a display of the first families of Monticello. Of course, the Berryesses were the first settlers in the valley after the Native Americans. And uh, so this is a picture of, of them, some of the Berryesses. This is a picture of one of their adobes. They, ca they called it the Adobe Ranch, where, um, where this place was. And this is where they were buried. They weren't really buried in the cemetery. They were just like on the ranches. And later they were all removed um, and brought up to Spanish Flat. This ranch right here is the Abraham Clark Ranch, but it is built on the old Adobe Ranch. So, so this is, uh, he was like one of the first settlers in Monticello and he had this huge ranch and this is a picture of the farming. And uh, that house was 27 rooms and 16 fireplaces and it actually burnt down prior to the re removal of um, the homes to make way for for Lake Berryessa. It burnt really, what I heard, it burnt super slow and that everybody in the valley was able to come in and take furniture out of it and to this day um, family members have a piece out of that house. Um, the cemetery, like the areas that people were buried, um, they had to have somebody go around and uh, show them where these graves were when they were digging it up to, to move them. And my grandfather was born and raised in the Berryessa Valley, so he had knowledge. He was like 76 at the time. He had knowledge of where these graves were because a lot of them didn't have markers. And his name was um, Ed McGinnis, and they called him Kingfish. And this is his saddle that he... He rode when he was in the various Valley, big high pack saddle. Threw a lot of bucks over the back of that. that of that, this down here is—I don't know if you can see it. It's a picture of uh, that same house. So that there was like a whole bunch of sun. So there was a lot of Clarks in the valley. So over here is the blacksmith shop and. This was built in about 1870. Um, Monticello was born in, in 1867, and then by 1870 it had, it had stores, blacksmith shops, um, hotels, and various other businesses. Uh, so this is the blacksmith shop, and this here is the Abraham Clark Mansion, the front of it. And then... Uh, over here is the picture of, uh, it, it was a uh, picnic, barbecue, rodeo in the early years. They're, over here they're cooking under the ground. Everybody there standing, like taking the picture and they have to stand still for so long. It's a great picture. Everybody in here is wearing hats. It shows all the cars parked back here. This here is, uh, these are my storytellers. Uh, this is my dad, was Ed McGinnis, that was his hat, that was my grandpa, and uh, Ed McGinnis Sr., and Henry Samuels' hat. So they were all my storytellers throughout these years. Monticello was known for their large rodeo and barbecue. This is a brochure, it was the ninth annual one of, of uh, May 5th, 1929. And, uh, this picture is of their barbecue and they're all standing in line waiting for food to come down through here. Here's the guys that are cooking. They're cooking underground. Uh, all the cars in the back. I, I've been told by my family and, and some of the old timers that 
that was the party of the year. You know, everybody came in, they had the rodeo, they had a huge dance, a uh, lot going on, coming over, the, coming over uh, on the dusty road. By the time you got home, you were just caked in dirt. But uh, a lot of fun. I wish I, I could have been able to go to one of those. <laughs> Uh, this is a picture of, it's a colored photo of, of Monticello uh, right before it was flooded. These are um, pictures of Buddy Gardner, I think his dad took them. So it shows the town right here. Uh, I don't know if you can see it. It shows there's Pewter Creek coming through and then a town. This photo over here is of the Rock Bridge. It's the Pewter Creek Bridge. It's a, it was the biggest rock bridge west of the Rockies at the time. It was uh, in, in Napa County. It was one of their uh, sites to see. It was. Uh, it still stands under Lake Berryessa. It's like 100, like 140 feet under the water. Over here is Murray Clark's family's ranch. Um, it was owned by somebody earlier, was bored off, but then it was owned by uh, Howard Clark. When the lake came in, they had to tear the whole house down and the family had to move out. Yeah, the Historical Society couldn't have done this collection without Carol. She's just been a tremendous resource for us, not only the artifacts, but the stories and uh, the collections that she's been able to bring to this. One of the things that uh, we got from her, uh, well, there's, there's two things that make this collection unique. Uh, we have two collections of photographs. This first one was by uh, Bill Clark, I think great-grandson of the Abraham Clark that uh, founded the Valley some hundred years before. Uh, Bill Clark was an amateur photographer. He also, also was a kind of a jack-of-all-trades field worker. And uh, in his spare time, he loved taking photographs. And he took some of the earliest color photographs of the Valley. Uh, he had a collection of over 3,000 photographs and he went around trying to photograph every person, every business, every farmer in the valley. And it's a real slice of life. I mean, you see kids riding on bicycles to school, people playing music in the local cantina, uh, you've got uh, just people hanging out in the local stores, there's uh, playing golf, uh, kids that are competing in high school competitions, sporting their their old jalopies and their and their new uh, race cars and uh, this is a slice of life from people who didn't know that within a decade this valley would be gone and uh, I want to contrast that this with another collection that we have on the other side of the wall and I'll I'll tell you more about that in a minute well, this collection of photographs was commissioned by Life magazine uh, in 1956, they found out that the valley was scheduled to be uh, inundated and they wanted to have somebody come in and document the destruction of the, of the town. They asked uh, uh, the famous photographer Dorothea Lang, who has done a lot of Depression era photographs and, and uh, Japanese uh, internment photos, uh, if she would come in and, and, and go into the town and meet people and, and begin to photograph as the town was destroyed. Um, she also asked Ansel Adams to work with her on this project. And Ansel was busy with another project so he couldn't do that and he asked a young photographer by the name of Perkle Jones. Well as it turned out Perkle Jones was very excited about the project. He ended up taking over a thousand photographs and I think Dorothy Lang took around 200. So most of the photographs in the collection are from Perkle Jones. And uh, this is a Dorothy Lang uh, photograph. One of the famous ones is that's on a small publication. The publication from Life magazine n never got published because, well we don't know why, but we think it might have been because the subject matter seemed a little too dark. But uh, they did a marvelous collection. They came in 
uh, one week at a time, and they would uh, they would meet the people, get to know them a bit, and get some very intimate, uh, high quality, beautifully artistic photographs. And the interesting thing in the collection, I think, is to compare this collection with that of Bill Clark, who was much more casual and um, less set up. Uh, all of these photographs are perfectly framed and, and uh, uh, they're black and white. They have uh, much more of a kind of a somber image to them. The difference is that all of the people in these photographs are aware of the fact that the valley is is going to be inundated within a couple of years. And so there's a, a somberness to it that uh, the photographs in Bill Clark don't have. So uh, Dorothy Lang and Perkle Jones did try to capture uh, life as it was in the valley. Uh, here's Albert McKenzie in the final days of uh, running his store, the, the general mercantile shop, the uh, McKenzie and Sons store. Uh, but here we've got uh, people moving out in a moving van. Uh, he's got um, farm workers and um, a lot of these photographs really got kind of the earthiness of, of the valley and those, a lot of those photographs made it into books like this, Purple Jones Collection. Uh, this one became the, uh, the, the front cover of, of this collection of photos. Uh, a lot of these photographs became kind of famous in their own right, even though they didn't make it into Life magazine. The collection uh, even includes the actual bulldozing and uh, then burning of, of homes. They scoured the valley so that there's nothing bigger than a toothpick left. They didn't want any of that debris getting into the new lake. Uh, and a few studies of, of people looking at the loss of their valley. Uh, people began to go back and visit the graves, so uh, even the graves were moved and, in, uh, and repositioned up in a higher part of the valley later on. In the corner here we have a television that has over a dozen videos that uh, show this exhibit and other exhibits in, in video form. Uh, ironically, this building uh, was built in order to house the engineers and the architects and the planners that built the dam that destroyed the, the town of Monticello. And here are some of the uh, original uh, architects and engineers that worked in this building. So it's ironic that here we are in this building that, that was really the, the idea center for building the dam that destroyed the city. Well, the people from Monticello didn't didn't go down without a fight. Uh, they put out this little booklet, uh, this is a reprint of it, that shows how vibrant the valley was with uh, farms and businesses that were functioning. And uh, even it has in the back some alternatives to building a, a, uh, a lake or for a reservoir. Um, but in the end, the argument that won was that building a lake of that size would do more good for more people than, than the few people that were, that were impacted by, by building the valley and, and removing the town of Monticello. Uh, I love this quote from uh, the, that, the governor of the time, Earl Warren. He said, every month 30,000 people are coming to California and not one of them brings a gallon of water. So the, the state was growing water is important. I mean, you can live without oil, but you can't live without water. And uh, that argument is the one that won in Congress. And so the construction of the dam began. We have pictures of them blasting uh, out at Devil's Gate and building the initial foundation. Uh, little rail cars that would, uh, that would bring the cement in and uh, the pouring of the dam. Uh, here's a construction hat from uh, the time of building the dam. And then uh, there was a period of promotion, promotion of the new lake as a place for recreation. We have a number of uh, publications that were put out and uh, uh, 
businesses that sprung up along the lake, and they really promoted it for a while. And uh, it was a, a thriving resort area for for some time. Um, they had a uh, fishing club from San Francisco that brought in kids uh, and and other promotional photos that uh, that try to draw attention and get people to come up and enjoy the lake. My family lived in Monticello and our house was actually moved to higher ground. It was one of the last houses that was moved. And uh, it, they put it up above overlooking the lake up at Spanish Flat right where they put the cemetery area. And um, I was born three years later. My sister, my brother, my mother, father, grandparents, they all lived in Monticello. So I grew up on all these stories of of the town down and you know below the lake and I always thought when I was a kid it was a hundred years ago you know that how could they have done that and as I got older I started listening more and more to the stories and every year uh, the old timers got together down at the cemetery and they called called it the old timers get together and then they would talk about the old times go out put flowers on the graves have a big picnic and uh, so every year I went with my mom and dad, and then as time went on, it was less and less and less people. And I, I was like, 12 years ago, there was like four people came. And I thought how sad that was, and how all life in Monticello and the rest of the story was uh, disappearing with these people that were leaving. And I had to grab on to it, so that's when I first started the Berryessa Valley exhibit up at, at uh, Spanish Flat and um, people started giving photos and stories and pictures and interviews and it just grew and grew and we had like an event every year at the same time as the old timers get together and all of a sudden families started coming out of the woodwork and and more stories and meeting relatives and it was just it it was great. It was we had like the um, fire truck, the original fire truck they brought up from the fire department for display, and and uh, we had speakers, and it just turned into something great. And as time went on, um, we had a fire up at Lake Berryessa, and we kind of lost the building that we were gonna uh, we, that we that we stored everything in, and so. The Winters Museum wanted to showcase this, and so it became a great opportunity to bring it down here and for more people to see. So it was really an exciting time, and uh, so now we're wrapping it up, and and hopefully it, uh, we'll be able to display some of this up at the lake at the bureau, and um, hopefully it can come back here in a couple of years. And uh, unfortunately, we're going to lose a lot of storytellers between in the next couple of years and uh, so I'm glad that we were able to do this that people were able to come here and tell their story I appreciate it <laughs>